And so along those lines and uh, with the question about Russia in general, Russia uh, doesn't seem to have been in the forefront of this, but Russia is a member of the Security Council, uh, a permanent member. And, uh, and Professor Ricci was uh, talking about perhaps Japan uh, feeling a little marginalized in this process. Is Russia marginalized in this process? And, uh, and if not, uh, what are Russia's red lines in this, if any? All right, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, you know, uh, I've been watching Korea for more than 45 years, and it has always been like a pendulum, swinging from the extreme tension to so some kind of detente. Uh, but these days, I think that this, uh, the amplitude of this pendulum is really stunning. Uh, I actually uh, knew pretty uh, comparatively well uh, former leader, Kim Jong-il, and he once compared uh, his uh, negotiation with the U.S. Uh, to a chess game. Uh, I believe that the current leader, his son Kim Jong-il, prefers poker. Uh, nuclear poker and the and the stakes are much higher uh, these days. Uh, however, now we have the most peaceful and promising period in uh, uh, the Korean uh, situation for many many years. And if you ask myself uh, if this persists, this situation would persist. I would just get given a uh, Nobel Peace Prize to President, uh, President Moon, President Trump, and <coughs> Kim Jong-un. I don't know whether it can be divided on three, but anyway, we have now the most peaceful period, and that actually satisfies uh, almost everyone, apart from conservatives who want to, uh, to push down North Korea by sanctions and pressure. Uh, so is uh, the agreements... Uh, on the reach in Singapore, a reach between North and South Korea are actually feasible. They are understood as complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of Korea in exchange for peace guarantees. Uh, the problem is that none of these, uh, uh, of these goals are attainable in the, in the first place and in the short run for sure. What is the security guarantees on the part of the United States? I don't think that maybe uh, uh, Dr. Powell wouldn't agree to me, but I don't think that uh, US system itself gives any possibility for the future government to keep the guarantees the previous, the, the previous government had given. And we see a lot of uh, that kind of US behavior, the latest being the uh, INF Treaty, uh, when obligations and the guarantees are withdrawn or uh, reconsidered. And this is just the nature of US political system, not ill will of, of uh, this or other rule. So how in that case uh, you could expect uh, North Korea to give up its only guarantee for survival? That's the nuclear card. However, there is an answer. The answer is that the process is more important than the result in this case. As long as negotiations are going on, as long as uh, North Korea uh, face by face uh, deny, uh, declines its uh, nuclear program, missile program. Uh, uh, it uh, gives up its uh, ideas of developing new weapons. It gives up uh, the danger of proliferation. Uh, and at some, at some phase, I think that North Korea uh, would only be left with a small uh, existing nuclear arsenal just to be on the safe side. I think uh, that would be a, a situation uh, uh, which, would be, uh, which would be better than the one that we had last year. Uh, and Mr. Im mentioned that with the constant uh, nuclear tests and missile tests and danger of big war. 
Um, I know that the U.S. side have already understand uh, this kind of situation. I met with Ambassador Began uh, last week in Moscow, and uh, now they use the uh, words full, uh, no, final, fully verifiable denuclearization. And you can argue what final means. Does final denuclearization include peaceful program, for example, or not? And there is a lot of room for, uh, for negotiation and reconsidering that. Uh, so, uh, one more thing about North Korea, about them cheating and breaking their obligations. One rule I have acquired uh, over years of dealing with North Koreans, uh, you should uh, understand that they will fulfill the obligations they have taken on them, not the obligations you think they have taken on them. And usually there is a misunderstanding that they must do this and that. If they hadn't agreed to that, they mustn't do and wouldn't do it. So you, you should be very objective and so far uh, I think that uh, uh, this negotiation progress should go on and on and on. And the longer it goes, uh, the better it is for both regional cooperation and the, uh, the international order as well. Of course, you can always argue that uh, North Korea keeping its uh, uh, nuclear potential for a prolonged time would deal a blow to the <coughs> non-proliferation regime. That's true. Uh, that's true, but at the same time, I don't think it will be a fatal blow. And uh, uh, in the current situation of, uh, uh, of the well, crumbling world order, interlude to some new world order, which we don't know how it will look like. And actually, if you see Russia and U.S. exchanges of uh, harsh words about nuclear containment, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to predict how the uh, situation <coughs> in the non-proliferation sphere will develop. Uh, so uh, maybe it would be better to have North Korea totally uh, give up their nuclear weapons and have the Korean Peninsula fully free of all nuclear danger. That would be better. But, you know, as Mick Jagger said, you can't always get what you want. I think what we can get now is peace process, and this peace process should be guaranteed by the political guarantees of the big powers which are involved in the Korean situation historically. I mean Russian idea on the uh, roadmap, starting from freeze, then negotiations, then multilateral guarantees. And here at this place we have the countries which should be a part of it. Uh, that's China, US, Japan, Russia, and Mongolia, because Mongolia is also a part of the Northeast Asia. Uh, so if we reach this stage, I think that uh, that would be a promising stage and it would take off tension, maybe for a prolonged period of time. Thank you.